Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the Straight Out of Prison podcast. My name is James K. Jones, and this is my story. And this is Haley Jones, and this is his story that has now become a part of my story. So this episode, we're going to be talking about Cairo's Cafe and getting that up and going and the process and, you know, just me realizing my dreams. Right. So it was a process, but also um, just to remind everybody from last week that what we talked about last week, the hot and steamy episode with his ex. <laughs> hot whoop, and steamy. Uh, well, <laughs> it wasn't hot and steamy, but that everything that we talked about last episode was happening at the exact same time of the things we're going to be talking about today. this episode. So we just separated them out so that it would be hard to tell the Cairo story without telling you know, all the mess that happened with the Shauna story. Right. Because they all, they happen at exactly the same time. And it is interesting because, I mean, I think everyone can relate to this, knowing what was going on, what we talked about last week, and that this, what we're talking about now, was going on at the same time. That's a lot of transition and change. Oh, uh, it was one, um, it was a very, it was a very difficult time, but. And I have to say, I'm going to kind of zoom out and jump forward for three seconds. And you said it was a very hard time and whatever. But the beginning of Kairos, I'm just going to mention, mm-hmm. was actually how we ended up meeting. Yeah. Way, I mean, way <laughs> later, not during this time at all. But it's just kind of neat to think of because I know what a trial this was. We're going to talk about it. But at the end of the day, we met yeah. through Kairos. It got me. It got me. My, Tim Busby said it perfectly. He said... So what if you lost a million dollars? You found your wife, so it's worth it. Yeah. It's like, okay. So no problem. (laughs) Million dollars, flush it down. Here we go. (laughs) Okay, so zooming back in. I think we're saying to start at the beginning. I worked for Mr. Ferletta that time. I was about five and a half years in. We uh, transformed the restaurant. We transformed everything about it. It was just, I just love having a next thing to do. Like something to work on, something to make it better. And we got to a place where, you know, we had a catering business, we had a delivery business, we had a, a banquets business, and, you know, there was nowhere else to go mm-hmm. at Leonardo's. And I think I coasted for maybe a year. You know, I was still making, you know, plenty of money, which, you know, that always... <laughs> is helpful. <laughs> the, the money part is helpful. <laughs> but I was getting to a place where I want to do my thing. I want, I want to do... I want my own place. Right. And we talked about that. That is kind of how you're made. Yeah. I'm always ready. You know, I'm not ready if it's not done, but once the this thing is done, I'm ready to, I'm ready for next. Right. So next for me was starting my own business. But I started looking into it and it just it was a daunting like task. Starting a restaurant is hard anyways. But mm-hmm. Steve bought the old Ollie's barbecue building in downtown Birmingham, right off of UAB campus. They transformed the whole building into like a church. Mm -hmm. So what used to be their barbecue pit was now where the kids, you know, the kids had uh, Sunday school. And what had been like the walk-in coolers, because this was a huge restaurant. It was like 10,000 square feet. It was was a big place. But they left one little corner of the building as like a dining room. And they took what had been the Ollie's Barbecue dish room and left that as the, like a little kitchen. And it had been there for five or six years. But every time I walked through there, I thought, you could have a restaurant in here. And I just got to thinking, okay, I'm either going to tell him what I want to do and see, let them tell me no, or this is going to continue to be a fantasy in my mind. Mm-hmm. Because I would, you know, I would sit and dream and think, and, oh, this could work, this could work, this could work. But it didn't really make sense to put a business inside of a church either. So I knew, and plus they were very conservative. Mm-hmm. But I, I got to a place where I just decided, I'm just going to put this out there and see what happens. And then when they tell me no, I fully expected them to tell me no. Yeah. Then when they tell me no, then I can just move on. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I, you know, we were having lunch and I pulled up on him. I said, I got to get this off my chest. And he was like delighted, like his eyes lit up. And he got all excited, you know. I had a small plan of what I wanted to do. I wanted to do like a lunch cafe, and then I wanted to do catering. You know, I knew like I couldn't do like dinner or anything there because of the location. Yeah. But he was just like giddy with excitement when I when I put the idea out there to him. But then he explained to me like how that church like worked. It was not a, uh, he couldn't just say this is what we're doing and you did it. 
Because right. they that the way that that type of church is ran is ran through the elders. Mm-hmm. So Steve was like the leader of the elders like board. So it'd be like a he'd be like a CEO, and then you have all these other people, you know, COO and CFO that would have to sign on to it. Yeah. So he he said, you know, I'd have to put it to them, and you know, some of them are very you know very conservative, mm-hmm. and um, so I was like, well, let's let's see what happens. And he had a meeting, I think it was that Tuesday night. I was at work at Leonardo's and I went out to check my phone because in those days, what was my rule at Leonardo's? Don't bring your cell phones up in here because you aren't going to be talking on the phone when we're supposed to be working. Mm -hmm. So in order for that to work, I had to not bring my phone in either. So I always left my phone in my car and I went out after when the uh, dinner shift was like winding down and I checked my phone. I had a message from him. He said, call me as soon as you can. And I called him, and he was just like over the moon. He was like, "They all said yes. They're so excited. They they all said every it was a hundred percent unanimous. Everybody said yes." And I was like, "Wow!" But that, that but then I was like, "Okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, okay, what's next? Where do we go from here?" So he uh, asked me to sit down and write out a vision, you know, for what I wanted to do, like practical stuff, how it would work, you know, how we would split up. The building, you know, uh, you know how I'd pay rent. How a business I'd... plan, basically. Yeah, yeah. And the fun, the fun part for me was writing out the, um, you know, writing out the menu because I knew what kind of food I wanted to do. I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to do Italian because I didn't want to compete with Mister Folletta because mm-hmm. I, you know, that was I wasn't going to do that. But I wanted to do like Southern food, like my granny and my mimo, and then maybe with like a. A Greek or Italian like spin, like a twist, and so that's that's what we call ended up calling it Southern food with a Greek twist. Mm-hmm. But I, I got the menu out, and then you know I wrote the vision for the cafe and the catering business. And in the beginning, I did not name it Cairo's Cafe, like because I I wanted something real simple, like a simple catering company, like a simple little cafe. And originally, I named it uh, Simplicity Catering. That was what it was going to be called. Hmm. We put that forward to the elders board, had them vote on it again. They were unanimous. You know, I mean, they were letting me know I would have to do everything. <laughs> right. You know, it would be on me to do everything, but that they would, you know, basically they gave me that space. So real quick, were you going to have to get every idea you, like, approved by this board? Like, every time you came up with something, did it have to have a vote? I was getting myself into a situation that I didn't see coming. Mm-hmm. Later on, yeah, it would be like that. Okay. Well, I it, just was curious. It was always something. But in the beginning, yeah. I did not think that. But then after they said yes and we started moving the ball forward, I sat down and had a meeting with Steve at his house. And that was my first, like, red flag because his... Uh, did you know it was a red flag at the time? I did, but I didn't... I thought maybe I was just being scared or, you know, trying to find a reason not to move forward. Right, yeah. But the red flag was just the way that he talked to me. Like, mm-hmm. he was very, like, forceful with me, like, just not in any way he'd ever talked to me before. Okay, so, like, forceful, like, when he was talking about what? Like, about... Like, how we were going to structure the business and how everything was going... How things were going to go. And it was just very, just matter of fact and almost, like, letting me know that he had all the leverage. Okay, so me hearing this for the first time, I can think... To me, oh, it just sounds like it. That was a business conversation because yeah. you know sometimes in business conversations you have to have hard conversations, right? So, it, what are you saying that it wasn't really like that, or it, it was, was more than that? But it was like a initial like red flag okay. for me that would prove true later on, right? But okay. it was just, like I'm getting myself into something that I'm not going to be able to get out of, and I'm allowing myself to be controlled in a way that I didn't want to be. Right. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, it does. But but you didn't know that at the time, so let's no, stick to this. But it yeah. was it was just like a red flag. I thought there's some, something is shifting here with our relationship, the mm-hmm. way he's talking to me. So he had the idea because he you know he's a pastor. He'd been in ministry pretty much most of his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did work some. He worked at UB Test some like part time. But he wanted us to raise the money through like fundraising. And, you know I don't like I don't like asking people for money. Like that's not my Right. I hate stuff like that. I'd rather, like, I'll come work for you and then you pay me for it. But I don't, I don't like asking people for money. So he, like, took me on this 
journey of like mentoring me into like you're not asking for money, you're asking people to invest in you, invest in your vision. So we spent probably a month or two like working on, you know, like contacts and coming up with people. And he thought the best way to do it would be to have a, a dinner party in what would later be the Kairos Cafe and then do a presentation and ask people to invest. So initially, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I thought I went through and, you know, priced stuff out. And I thought I needed like between thirty and fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. That's what I thought I needed to, uh, you know, get started. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there was a lot. I knew there was a lot that needed to be done, like upgraded and, and fixed. But uh, that was going in. I thought I needed between thirty and fifty thousand dollars. That yeah. was my plan. So we had the meeting. You know, I fed everybody. They got to eat all the food. Then we had a uh, went back in the church. We had a presentation. Just curious, who paid for, like, all the food supplies and stuff? Did you pay it for it personally? Yeah. Okay, so you bought all the food and cooked, like, just yeah as an attempt to try to raise money for the restaurant. Okay. Well, I think we might have had, like, 50 or 60 people there. Okay, I mean, that's a lot of people to cook for. I mean, but I invited everybody. I invited people from the Leonardo's world. I invited mm-hmm. people from, you know, church, people I knew, people from, you know, volunteers that I'd known in prison. I invited everybody that I knew. Yeah. Because he said, instead of trying to, like, get a partner and go for, like, somebody with big money, you know, if you need $30,000, you just need 30 people to give $1,000. Yeah. Invest. So he came up with, we came up with, like, these contracts where there would be, like, interest and repayment and all stuff. Um, And he started it off, him and Lenore, he invested $1,000. He was like, put me on first. Um, So that's how we, that's how we kicked it off. But after the, uh, the party that we had... I raised my thirty thousand dollars that first night. Wow! And I remember Miss Folletta was there, um, and she she just was like had tears in her eyes, and she came up to me and she was like, "My kids would never get up there and ask <laughs> for something like that. <laughs> they tell me to do it." And mm-hmm. I was like, "Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm do- I don't like it, but I'm doing what I." You're like, we we don't want Norma Jean up there asking for money. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was good. So I, I had my start. This was like January two thousand and five. And we were ready to move forward. Now, if you go back to the last season, this was right when Sean came home. So mm. it started off just us, and then it, <laughs> things uh, evolved. Yeah. <laughs> so Okay, so first night, that's incredible. So you said you had about 50 or 60 people there. Mm-hmm. And after you, I mean, what was your pitch? Like, what did you say when, when you asked for money? Because that is a hard thing to do. That I just, I want to start this restaurant in this building. And, and will you give me some money to do it? <laughs> well, no, it wasn't just a, like a fantasy dream. I had, I had a business plan, or at least what I thought was a business plan. <laughs> I had the menu. I had the, uh, I had statistics from the oh, area. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, that was in a very busy area. There was like you know fifty thousand people that rode by there on their way into work in Birmingham every day, and then rode out. So I had all this, all these ideas, and mm-hmm. I had. Been to, I did my homework. I went to every restaurant and ate lunch in that area just to see. And they were always packed and busy. And because there's so many people in downtown Birmingham. Right, working in the corporate buildings and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then the school was there. And there's just so much going on. But another interesting fact is the night before we did the uh, investors thing, because I had to write out contracts with people. Mm -hmm. Like they would give me a check, I'd write out a contract, we'd sign and get it witnessed. Then they'd keep a copy. I kept a copy. Mm-hmm. I changed the name. I just, it was, it's a weird. Okay, so the night before this dinner, you, you changed the name. I changed the name from Simplicity Catering. It was going to be Simplicity Catering, and then we're going to have the Simplicity Cafe. Okay, so what prompted the change? I think it was Jesus. I felt, I did feel like it was. So this mm-hmm. is, most people don't know this, and when I try to explain to people, especially like Kairos people, they get, like they act like they don't hear what I said. I did not name that Kairos Cafe. And it's weird because Kairos was the prison ministry when I was in prison. And it's Kairos is a Greek word that means God's special time. Mm-hmm. And that was what we were looking to do, like do special special lunch, special catering, all the things. But there was a group of uh, students that came down. I think it was the first year that we were in that building. And they were doing like a college ministry and they asked if they could use that portion of the dining room of the church where the dining room was mm-hmm. to start like a coffee 
like deal for kids to come and hang out on like Friday, Saturday night. And they named it Kairos Cafe. And that was, I didn't have anything to do with that. So how long before this restaurant was that, did that happen? Probably about three years. Okay. It so had it been long there. before, yeah. Well, no, I mean, like they had a, uh, you know, Nelson Grice, he was an elder and he was a worship leader, but he's also an artist. He taught mm-hmm. art at Hoover High School. He would come in and do murals. So he did this huge mural with a coffee cup and it said Kairos Cafe. And they called that Kairos, mm-hmm. that area Kairos. They wouldn't say go in there into the dining room. they say it's in Kairos. So I thought, I think it. I thought, they probably don't want me to say that. But I called Steve the night before. I said, I really, you know, I know y'all have this Kairos Cafe thing going on, and this really fits me a little bit better. So I'm thinking about changing the name of my business to Kairos Catering. And he was like, I love that idea. So it's just, it's kind of weird. Like, yeah, I didn't name it. I didn't, it was already there. It was already Kairos Cafe when I got there. So, yeah, so Kairos Cafe, I mean, yeah, it's, I just want to ask real quick because you said you were going to name it Simplicity, Simplicity Catering and then Cairo's Catering, but was there some reason you weren't putting the like cafe in there, or did you want the main part Wait, of your business to be the catering part? I don't understand what you're saying. Well, when you when you first said I was, I decided to name it Simplicity Catering. That was my initial plan. Yeah. Okay, so but I guess maybe you just say that instead of Simplicity Cafe or. Simplicity. Well, no, I knew the the cafe part was going to be like an afterthought. Okay. See, I didn't realize that. Well, no, I wanted to make my money in catering because I knew from Leonardo's, like, right. that's where the money was. Like, okay. if you want to make a lot of money, do catering. Okay. I don't think that was clear because I didn't understand that. This is probably not clear to other people, so that's a good question. Right. Yeah. I didn't want to, I really didn't want to start with a restaurant business. Okay. And in my vision that I had, it said that I was going to start a catering business and then start a restaurant. Okay. So I thought this would like be a good starting point because I could keep my staff small and I could make money. Right. So that was my full on plan. But I also knew that you don't just, wake up one day and decide to start a catering business. Right. Because if people don't know what you're doing. Exactly. They don't know your brand. They don't know your style. It's not going to work. And I love the idea of just having to do lunch five days a week. You know, that's almost refreshing. Right. Like, you know, uh, 10.30, 2.30, you know, come in, eat lunch, get to know the, the food, get to know the, you know, how we do things. And then people want you to do their catering. It's funny. I mean, I do have a short-term memory, but all the years that we've been married now, and talked exhaustively about Kairos. I did not realize that that was the intent from the beginning to start with just the catering and then the cafe was afterthought. Yeah, that was my strategy. Okay. All right. So, so the we, name changed. Name changed to Kairos Catering when we got to work. I had a great time playing in the kitchen. It was <laughs> it was very difficult because it was such a small, narrow space. It mm-hmm. had actually been the Ollie's Barbecue dish room. Uh, there was nothing in there I could use except a sink. Um, the back part of the the kitchen, like where the door went in and out, there was still a furnace there where they, oh, wow. they burnt, like they had a full service barbecue restaurant where they, you know, they served thousands of people a day. So they would, uh, I think they burned their trash in that. Uh, this was before the EPA and all that stuff. Yeah. What's EPA? The, I'm like, yeah, what's EPA? En- environment. Protection agency. Oh, okay. Like they probably couldn't get away with that now. But there okay. was a, a there was just a lot of stuff before we started. There was a lot of stuff that had to come out. Yeah. So they had put like uh, some old home refrigerators and some old home ovens in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it, and some old dusty cabinets and so I told Steve before we're going to like I gotta like before we get started I gotta get all this crap out of here. So we went on a, like a um, I had a lot of people helping me from the church. We just basically pulled everything out of there. And I remember looking at the uh, the furnace thing because it was like big as a room and it was uh, like cast iron. Like, how, wow. are we, how are we going to get that out of here? <laughs> so initially I got very overwhelmed with like, how can I, I was, you know, I was working full time. Uh, how am I going to do this? So in the last episode, we talked about Tanya and Jeremy, the Steve's, second daughter and her husband Mm -hmm. like we were like good friends at that time they were my best friends at that time we we hung out two or three times a week well he was working for uh city wholesale like delivering like driving a truck delivering groceries or i can't remember but uh i just kind of floated the idea with him like what would he think about working with me 
And I just like dropped it and left. And the next day, Tanya called me and was like, can you please call Jeremy? He was up all night with excitement. Like he really wants to work with you. So called him back. You know, we sat down. I think it was me, him, and Tanya. We had a conversation. And he basically came on board. But I told him, I can't pay you till we get open, you right. know, till we get started. But so uh, did he quit his job? Not till we open. Not oh, till okay. we get, not to the end. But no, I was clear about that. Like I'm, I can't give you. I, you know, if you want to help, help. But it, it's going to be like a, <laughs> an investment. You know, you know, a ministry. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Uh. But uh, he came on board with me, and then we started working together, and that kind of helped the ball start moving forward. Mm-hmm. But then. I didn't know the things that I didn't know. I didn't know about codes and, <laughs> you know, I set up an appointment with the health department, went with them. Mr. Ollie, the guy that had originally owned Ollie's Barbecue, while well, he was actually his son, he knew one of the health department guys, and somehow Steve got that name for me, and I made the appointment with this guy. And he came out and basically told me, everything you got that you've written down, all these plans, you can't have them. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, you have to have plans, like, from an architect. So I was like, why? Like, the building's already here. And he was like, this building is not ready for a food service establishment. So fast forward, I had to go hire an architect, and, you know, he ended up charging me three or four grand just to draw up these plans. As they do. And he basically came in and told us, everything you have here is not going to work. So it was very daunting. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Fire codes were bad. The uh, plumbing was bad. The electric was bad. Like everything, we had to do a total like renovation of that side of the building. It was actually about a quarter of the building. So Mm -hmm. I had to totally renovate the dining room, the dish room. There was an office and then a back room and then a bathroom. Totally had to renovate that. And then... The fire codes were bad, so we were going to have to put in a sprinkler system, which was like fifty thousand dollars. I can't remember. It was a so that thirty thousand dollars is yeah, it just was not looking so went up, went up, <laughs> went up in a puff of smoke. Yeah. <laughs> so we went back and forth with him, and then Steve was involved with that. With uh, but you know the elders had to vote on every single thing. So basically, what they came up with was a plan where we we wouldn't have to put in sprinkler systems but we would have to put in firewalls which meant we had to go through the whole building and redo all the walls and they had to be like uh four thick had to have fire doors it was rough it was a lot but people that were part of the church at that time were so excited that we just had a work day and everybody volunteered and came and we i think it took three or four days for us to put up the new walls and do all that stuff and you, you remember mickey graber Yes. Her husband, Dan, he was like my main, he was an elder at, at, the, at that time. But he he just was like, let's just do it. Let's get it done. You know, I got a week off. Let's take a week and I just do that. it. And then It's I, really neat how they rallied around. Oh, yeah. Like, Everybody was excited. But then, you know, then you had to repaint everything and to redo everything. And it was mm-hmm. just such a long, drawn-out process. But then, you know, we got through the codes for the health department. But then when the county came in, then it was another set of things. And I think the biggest one that just made me want to quit and say never mind was they had just instituted a grease department. <laughs> a the, grease department? Yeah. What is that? Like My, release the grease? No. <laughs> like food service can let a lot of like grease and oil out into the environment. And so they came up with this new department of, of grease in Jefferson County. And basically... Um, they came and made sure you had a grease trap, mm-hmm. which we did, but he said it wasn't big enough. And then, let me just, long story short, I had to spend uh, $30,000 on just a dumpster pad that was behind the building that had plumbing, ran to it with hot water, it had to have hot water. <laughs> These are the codes. Gosh. These are the codes. It had to be a covered uh, dumpster pad. It had to have... Fences and locks. You gotta really want to start that restaurant now, <sighs> Lord or have catering mercy. business. And then the, the grease trap thing, they had to put in like a, a three hundred gallon grease trap, and so they had to dig up the parking lot, and you know find a plumber to do that. It it was just, and then knowing that it was nonsense, you know that I was never going to use hot water in a dumpster pad. I mean, what just wasn't going to happen? 
And we didn't have a contractor because we couldn't really afford it. And we were like working on a tight, tight budget. And you would get people in that would start to do stuff and then, you know, wasn't good. <laughs> like I had so many, I got ripped off so many times by especially uh. like church people that did business. Okay, but pause here because you just said that dumpster pad was cost thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Okay, so at some point in all those things that you've just said in the last sixty seconds, <laughs> yeah. you must have realized, okay, I need more money. Oh yeah, we're not gonna make it. So what were you thinking? I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. But then Steve, like he wanted to like raise money. Let's just go back and do another round. And I hate stuff like that. I, I don't like asking people for money. I just don't like it. Yeah, it's something about that kind of rubs me wrong. Not that I think it's bad, but it just feels like. But he would always be like, "You're just you. You don't think the right way. It's, it's not. It's, it's not you're asking for money. They're you're, they're investing in you." And I'm like, I'm still asking them for to write a check. <laughs> so I, I mean, yeah. I don't like stuff like that. So what ended up happening during that process was he he and Jeremy started like working their networks and they they jeremy didn't but steve pulled in some investors um i'm no i take that back jeremy's parents did invest i think they gave us like two thousand dollars but jeremy went on a campaign like he was always okay so i can imagine that you must have like as i hated this said, part of well it. hold on that they're using their network and then jeremy's parents gave two thousand dollars i'm just thinking how i would feel and how you must have felt just kind of this as people are just giving money, you feel this added pressure, like, I have to make this work. Oh, no, no, no. That's no, no. how I would feel. Okay, time out. They were not giving money. They were investing into Kairos, and I had to write them a contract with a repayment schedule. Like, I asked for a year. Like, okay. give me a year to make money. Okay, but even still, that's another, like, I feel like avenue that brings stress because then, you know, I, I'm going to have to get this up and I have to, like, pay back. Ugh. But then it ended up being, like, people I know, like my Aunt Sue put some money in. And then there was a girl that I worked with. Her grandmother died and left her a bunch of money. And she put in, like, I think she put in, like, $8,000. Like, I mean, she believed in the Kairos. Wow. But it was, it was just, it was a lot. And it was a lot of pressure. And then we were doing all this, and it wasn't bearing any fruit because we got, you know, by this time we were about like six, seven months in, and it just, wow. the news just kept getting worse. Everything kept getting worse. It's like every time you did something, it revealed something else that needed More that to be you done had to that do. cost money. Yeah. And the problem with it, you had the health department, you had to pass the health department, you had to pass the county, you had to pass the city, you had to pass the fire department. And then you had to pass this new grease department, environmental, which is it's a racket. I mm-hmm. mean, <laughs> it, I don't even know if it still exists. But anyways, pushing through all that, in the middle of all this, I had an idea. Um, I don't know if it was an idea or what it, or if it was Jesus, but I thought it almost every day for like two weeks. Um, this was when uh, Bush was president. Big Bush, Little Bush? W. Bush, George W. Bush. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. And he would always, he was a big, like, talk about business, and, you know, he was always talking about, you know, you need to own your own home, you need a business, and, you know, I was listening to him, and so I thought, well, listening to him go on and on was why I stopped renting an apartment and bought a house, because he kept, that was during the time, that's stuff that he was pushing, like, as president. Mm -hmm. So I just felt like I needed to write, (laughs) I needed to write a letter to the president, (laughs) And tell them a story. <laughs> okay. So I thought it was crazy and silly, <laughs> but uh, I sat down. I think it was late after I got off work one night. It was another one of those things like, I feel like I need to do this. I just need to do it. I'll probably never hear anything back from this. So you don't have to, so you could stop thinking about it, really? Yeah. So did you longhand a letter? No, I, I typed it. I have okay. a copy of it somewhere. Okay. And it was just like, Dear President Bush, my name is James K. Jones. I told him like a brief like capsule of my story and you know that. I was trying to start a business and I was stuck and didn't fully think I would get it. I don't think I told anybody that I did that. <laughs> so it was kind of silly. No, I did tell Steve. I told Steve and he, he kind of chuckled at me when I told him. About two, three weeks later, I got a call from the White House. <laughs> <laughs> And it was a voicemail. You never know, do you? <laughs> crazy. It was a voicemail on my cell phone. When I was at work, God, and that is insane. It freaked me out, and it was like, "This is so and so calling from the White House. We got your President Bush got your letter." Blah, blah, blah. 
And so I called back. <laughs> we had a little chat. And it wasn't like the Oval Office. It was like somebody, you know, he probably. Well, still. He probably never read the letter. But they, you know, his staff, you know, the White House has got hundreds of people that work there. But whatever it was, it tugged on the heartstrings. Right. And they got back with me. <laughs> <laughs> and she told me that I needed to go through the Small Business Administration, and I didn't know what that was. And But lucky for me that there, the chapter for North Alabama was in Birmingham. So she set me up a meeting with the Small Business Administration. It's, in, uh, it's actually in Homewood, right outside of Birmingham, and got me an appointment. Okay, the irony of this, <laughs> hold on. It's silly. That, no, <laughs> that you wrote, had to write a letter to the President of the United States, mm-hmm. and send it to Washington, D.C., for them to read it and call you and set up a meeting with an office that was in Birmingham the whole time. Yeah, well, you needed a connection. Oh, so you couldn't just, like, get an appointment? I mean, I'm sure you could have, but I didn't yeah. even know it was there. I, that, I know, and that you found out it was there because of that letter, which is awesome. But they actually wrote me a letter back. I've got, I used to have it hanging in my office. I need to... You need to find that. I'll post put it on, it on our media. on our Patreon thing. Oh, yeah, Patreon. Yeah. That's good, yeah. Anyways, long story short, I got up, dressed, got dressed up, <laughs> put on a suit and tie, you know, made myself look sharp. This is amazing, truly. I had on my shiny shoes that Mr. Folletta bought me for Mr. Bruno's son's wedding, and... <laughs> Strode up into the Small Business Administration. I'm James K. Jones. I have an appointment, and you know it was one. It's a federal building, so they like took your license and you know frisked you and gave you a name tag and all that stuff. Okay, but pause. So, what did Steve say when you told him that the White House called you? Oh, they were over the moon. <laughs> they were over the moon because I called them. It was actually him and Lenore. I called them and, and just played the voicemail over my home phone oh, to them. Yeah. And it, it was crazy. That, that was crazy. It was crazy. So anyways, I went in there. He explained to me how it worked. The Small Business Administration would love to help me, but they don't actually give money. They don't do money. They do uh, guarantees for loans. So they will guarantee like 80% of a business loan if you go through their process. And then you have to go to a bank and get the money. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like... So they're basically signing for you. Yeah, like co-signers. Yeah. But I mean, it's the federal government. So I mean, it's not too risky to do that. Right. So... We got rolling with that. He gave me, it was quite a process of things that I had to go through. Uh, one of the things I had to do was he gave me an outline to rewrite my business plan that was like what they wanted. But I had to have someone sign off on it. Like, and it couldn't be him. Like, they have these kind of like coaches, I guess, mm-hmm. but they're like business owners that want to help other small business owners get started. And he connected me with a guy in Decatur, Alabama, who had, I think he had like four or five coffee shops and bookstores in Decatur. Do you remember his name? Um, Jay something. The name of his things were Java Jays. Okay. But anyways, they sent me to him. I was going to have to spend the day with him. So that's about an hour and a half drive north of Birmingham. So I set up the meeting, went up there, had my business plan. Um, he had started some really neat businesses there, like little coffee shops and, you know, like chicken salad, you know, nothing like what I wanted to do, but like more simple type of stuff. But then he would get four or five people that worked for him and he would grow the business and then he would uh, sell it to one of them. Like he would let oh, neat. he would let the workers eventually like they knew they could work towards that. Like if I, you know, work hard and we keep doing this, then they. At that time, there were three of them that were owned by former employees, which was neat. It's kind of, it was kind of like a franchise situation. Maybe. Yeah. But not really. Like, he was more like, he was passionate about investing in people. Yeah. And he had a business mind. And, you know, he took me to all of them. I was kind of getting annoyed. Like, by the time we went to the fourth one, I'm like, they're all the same. So, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we went to his main one. We sat down. He went through my business plan, you know. You know how they do. They go through the red mm-hmm. thing and tell you, what does this mean? And let's do this. And he signed off on it. And on my way out the door that day I was leaving, he said, I noticed you had a dishwasher. Like, you need a dishwasher, like, on your equipment. Because they wanted to know everything. Like, yeah. even, like, silverware. And, you know, they, they needed yeah. to know everything. He said, I actually have a dishwasher back here. You know, when I bought this, there was a dishwasher in here. And, you know, we don't use dishwashers because we, you know, we use paper stuff. You can have it if you want it. And I was like, I looked at it and it was like, it wasn't brand new, but it was 
almost brand new. It was like a Hobart. It was like... Hobart, baby. No, it was like a $5,000 dish machine. One of the ones, you know, you lift up and down. And I couldn't believe it. So we put it on the back of my truck and strapped it down, and I drove back to <laughs> Birmingham. But if you go back to the last episode, that was when... On the way back, I was so excited. That was when Steve called me and told me that I was sending in to stay away from Shauna. Okay. So the whole thing got twisted and awkward. and But anyways, at this time, there was that going on, and I didn't really like it, but I was trying to be, uh, what was I trying to be? Uh, obedient. Yeah. To the, to Honoring, the, maybe. Yeah, and, you know, doing what they asked me to do. I was staying away from Shauna, but I got real busy with doing the covers. Plus, I was still working full-time at Leonardo's, but I was feeling guilty at work because I hadn't told Tony yet. You hadn't told Tony that what? That I was in the process of starting a restaurant. Oh, you hadn't at this point? No. Even after all this rigmarole? No. It was Even uh, after a call from the White House? No. <laughs> you didn't tell him. I couldn't tell him. I couldn't pull the trigger. No, no, I, I think I had told him because he he came to my initial meeting. Okay, right. yeah, you said that. Yeah, he came to my initial meeting. But somewhere during this process, we were already putting up walls and doing stuff. I couldn't tell him. Like I couldn't come. I couldn't bring my heart to tell him what I was doing. So I told him a little Tony. I said, I need y'all to go for a ride with me. I need to show you something. And I just took them in there, and they were like, "What is this? And was this where you go to church?" I was like, "Yeah." What's going on here? And I said, well, I'm planning to open a restaurant. And that's how I told him. Oh, how I could, did that go? What did they say? He didn't want to see me go, but he loved me and wanted me to do, you know, he wanted me to follow my heart. Yeah. He wanted me to, but I think initially he, you know, he had some advice for me, you know, food costs, stuff like that. But he was excited about the Kairos aspect because he was a Kairos man. Mm-hmm. But uh, after I told him, it got easy. Like Right. And... I think he had like this fantasy <clears throat> that my mom adopted later on was that I was going to go try that and fail. And then I would never really leave Leonardo's. Like I would still be a part of Leonardo's. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I mean, I stayed connected to Leonardo's even after I started Cairo's. But, uh, this was where it got weird. Once we got past the planning stages, you know, everything started falling into place. Okay. Assuming, cause we didn't really finish this. You did end up getting the loan. Well, no, this was where it got weird. Okay. This is where it got weird. We went in, um, these are like federally backed loans, and we found out that because I was on parole, I was still on parole at that time, I couldn't get a loan because I was on parole. Like, it was not, I, oh. I was still a high-risk individual, at least for that kind of bank and stuff like that. And how long had you been out by this point? Six years, five years, six, okay. years, six years. Okay. But it's still, when you're on parole, like... And technically, you were still on parole. I was still on parole. Wow. But, I mean, sometimes the first time I tried to get life insurance, I couldn't get life insurance because I was on parole. Okay, really quick. How long were you on parole total, just to give me 13 idea. years. Wow. Okay. I mean, I told you, you get in trouble. <laughs> 13 <laughs> it's years. Easy to get what? in. It's okay. hard to get out. So, you couldn't get a loan. So, then what happened? So, we were, like, stuck. And... This was my idea. It came to me. Did you write another letter to President Bush? <laughs> no. I mean, I got the help that I needed. We had everything was there. The money was there. It just couldn't be me. Oh, wow. So I didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, I'll just put everything in my mom's name, you know, because I think that song was out during the time I put everything <laughs> in my mama's name. And that's okay, because I'm going to ride. <laughs> But she didn't want anything to do with it. Like, she said, no, I'm not getting involved in that. Like She started off, she was going to be one of my, she was going to go work with me, but then all the stuff with Sean started happening. There was a rift between her and Stephen Lenore, then she started getting aggravated with them, and she got to this place when I talked to her about that. She said, no, I don't, no, count me out, I'm out. Oh, so it was really becoming a real, I mean, it was excuse drama. my French, a real, like, shit show, kind of. Yeah, but I know. thought, who do I trust? I trust my mama completely. Like, my mom would never rip me off. And I thought, who's the other person I trust? Is there anybody else that I trust fully, like, fully trust to, right. like, sign over things to? And it was Steve. He was the only one. Mm-hmm. And so the idea came to me. It was that night when I was brushing my teeth, and I called him, and he was discouraged. Everybody was discouraged. Like, right. what are we going to do? So I said, what do you think about being my business partner and going into the restaurant business with me? So I initially, I asked him. He was like, mm-hmm. what are you talking about? And I said, you ain't got to do nothing. Just let me put everything in your name, and you do the loans, and we'll go from there. Mm-hmm. 
And he said, well, let me think about it. I need to talk to my wife. And it came back with, they did some, it took three or four days, but they did some studying. Like, even if it went bad, like, because it was a business loan, they couldn't come after them personally. Right. That she told him he could. So we went back to the lawyer that incorporated my business. <laughs> and told him, I told him I wanted to put all my stock over into Steve's name. And I'd already put 10%. I gave Jeremy 10% of the stock and Lenora 10% of the stock because they were both coming to work for me and they were helping me build it. Mm -hmm. So they were part of the team. So I'd already did, like I had 80% of the stock in my name, 10% for Lenora, 10% for Jeremy. And when I went back to the lawyer to get put my 80% into Steve's name, he told me, don't do this. Like, don't. What mm -hmm. are you doing? Why did he tell you not to do it? Well, I explained to him, I said, I can't get the loan stuck. I can't get the loans. He said, but if you do this, then you don't own your business anymore. It's not your business. And I said, well, he's not going to like rip. And this was in front of Steve was sitting there with me. I said, he's not going to rip me off or anything like that. And he's like, look, I'm your lawyer. I get paid to advise you. Don't do this. This is a bad idea. This is a bad deal. And it's not going to end well. I've seen too many people come in my office and sit here and have all these like rainbow and butterfly dreams and they ne it's, this never works out. Don't do it. Figure out another way, but don't do this. And then Steve, Steve kind of got his feelings hurt and he was like, well, look, my only thing that I'm doing here is trying to help James succeed and, you know, see his dream, you know, do all the things. And the lawyer was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> what was the lawyer's name? Do you remember? I can't was? remember. He had a lot of like Christian paraphernalia in mm -hmm. his office, like fishes and, <laughs> you know. But, yeah. that, you know, they do that. And, you know, this is a Bible belt. And, you know, if you want extra business, you put a fish by your name in the yellow pages. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he... Uh, in the yellow pages? That was when he still had the yellow pages. <laughs> okay. Um, and, you know, he advertised on Christian radio, all that stuff. Yeah. But I think that's how I found him. I don't know. Well, but, he obviously was giving you sound advice. He was, but I said, well, this is what I'm doing, so I just need you to draw it up, fix it up. So you basically were like, do it anyway. This yeah. is what I'm doing. I didn't see another way. Yeah. Like, this is the only way to move forward. So we move forward <laughs> in that way, but it, uh, something something changed after that with the whole process mm -hmm. because this was where stuff was heating up at the same time stuff was heating up with Shauna. Oh yeah. Then me and Lenore were having friction and me and Jeremy were having friction. I actually got, I couldn't stand Jeremy. I couldn't stand looking at him. I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't, but it was because Shauna was living in their house and it was just this, he was always telling on us. And I'm like, we're grown men. You know, you're a man. Why are you telling like a little girl? I don't understand. I don't James. get all this. But no, he he's made that way. He's very rule oriented and he he would uh he thought he was trying to protect me, but it was just weird like if we were in church and uh, Sean and I were trying to would get close to having a conversation, he'd come stand in between us. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Look, bro, no, don't whatever you're doing, you need to stop doing it with me. So that caused us a lot of friction. And then I was so overwhelmed with the contracting stuff. Um, that Jeremy kind of took that over, but then he got real hostile about it. Well, I know we, we, I feel like I said this last episode, but I'll say it again. It was just, there's so many dynamics going on and there's so many, it was crazy time. Um, just, I mean, I can just see how so many things could creep in not just emotion wise, but just like resentment wise with the girlfriend stuff and him. It was I bad. guess trying to act like he was your parent and protect you when yeah. you don't need protecting. No, but he in that way. he was the I didn't I don't think I mentioned this. He was the youth pastor there, so he was like trying to be youth pastor to me. I was like, well, the problem with that is I'm not a youth. I'm older right. than you. Like I've got a lot more life experience than you got. So um, if you could like find a way to miss me with all that, that'd be great. But uh, we ended up getting I think it was three pretty substantial loans like there was like a 50,000 a 30,000 and a 20,000 they came from three different banks so but they didn't all come at once we got like one then we had to go back and get another and we had to go because everything every like step in this process was oh no you got to do now you got to do this mm -hmm. and then it was hard for me because it was like I'm renovating this whole freaking building and they could kick me out and I'm on the hook for all this money and 
by the time it was over with it, and it was close to three hundred thousand dollars that Whoa. that I had out there. And no, 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 that was Kyra's Cafe Gardendale. Excuse me, <laughs> it was close to one hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars that I was on the hook for. So, but technically, legally, Steve was on the hook for. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm just that's how it is. I mean, I know you were on the hook, and but this is where the whole thing is complicated, you know, and messy because yes, you were on the hook, but which probably made you feel even more pressure it being in Steve's name. It was, yeah, it was because I didn't want to mess him up, yeah, you know, or you know, his wife, you know, they had they were doing doing good for themselves. I didn't want like anything to, I didn't want to be the person that caused those kind of problems. So it was a lot of pressure. And then yeah. add to that the stuff with Shauna and then me knowing that I'm going to have to work with Lenore and Jeremy every day and then try to deal with the stuff that was going on. It was just, a, it was a rough time. But, you know, during that process, Jeremy kind of took over the contracting part of it. And then... Um, contracting? Oh, you mean like the building and We didn't have a, con- we, didn't, we couldn't afford a contract. Right, so okay. we were having to like find a plumber or find an electrician or... Um, at the end, I had to come back in because nope, he wasn't getting anybody to finish or do anything, and I just called everyone. Like, we got to get done. Like, I don't care. I don't hear anymore about anything you got to say. Come and do this work, and, and or I'm not going to pay you. It's funny because I can see how that situation gets more and more pressure packed because you're wanting to get it open to be able to make money to pay yeah. off all these loans now you have. Okay, so in retrospect, really quick, though, mm-hmm. in retrospect, do you feel like it was – kind of where it all really started going wrong or maybe the big decision that like was the fork in the road is when you said like went against the lawyer's advice yeah. and and put all the loans in Steve's name. Yeah, it wasn't good. So I mean I'm asking you do you think that was the big thing that kind of like the shifted whole thing it? the whole thing was bad. Yeah. The whole thing was bad. Then you had the stuff with Shauna going on Steve's attitude kind of changed towards me because we had a team, the four of us would meet once a week and plan what we were doing that week, you know, to keep the ball moving forward. And at the time that all this stuff started happening with Shauna, and then if you remember from the last episode, I canceled them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I also put the brakes on this. I was like, I'm not doing this. This is crap. I'm not getting sucked into this. I'm not getting stuck in this. I'm gonna figure out. I got to figure out a way to get out of it. So I put the brakes on it. But the reality is, you all you already really felt stuck. <sighs> I was stuck. Lord have mercy. Yeah. But I, I I put the brakes on it for like two or three months. Like I I didn't even try to meet. Like I don't want to meet right now. I ain't mm-hmm. nothing to talk about. So during that process, Steve kind of took the reins from me for that. So now I had Jeremy like doing a hostile takeover of the process of the contracting <laughs> and then Steve doing like a gentle, you know, I'm just going to ease in here and take over cause James can't handle this mm-hmm. kind of deal. So uh, that just bothered me even more. Cause now I feel like, you know, like, like they're, in, they're controlling me and I, I didn't like that. I yeah. hated every part of it. And then, but we just kept, you know, I kept pushing through and then, you know, there was this thought, like, if this is what you want, or these are really your dreams, like, what you just keep going. Mm-hmm. So we got to the end, and we ran out of money again, and we didn't have any, you know, we were stuck. But we were right on the, you know, we were, like, on the 20-yard line. We're in the red zone. Right, right. So I did some very foolish things during that time. Like what? I bought my house in 2003. Uh, this was 2006. There was a huge housing bubble during that time. Mm-hmm. So, like. My townhouse, when I bought it for like one thirty, it was valued at like one eighty mm-hmm. at this time. So I took out like a forty thousand dollar home equity line, mm-hmm. sunk it all in Cairo's, and then my last like two or three week push of trying to get open, I went and maxed out all my credit cards at the bank. Like oh. I had like ten or twelve credit cards, but I didn't even know you could do this. You can go to the bank and tell them I want to put five thousand dollars in my account with this credit card, just and they would swipe it. And so it was basically, it was, it was a disaster. (laughs) That whole thing was a disaster. It it almost feels like it was like a panic move. Like everything was kind of, yeah, we got to do, we got to go, we got to do what we got to do. We got to finish. And we barely, barely, barely like eased in there. And it was the end of the year. The Christmas season was starting and I wanted to wait till the first of the year. And I was in a meeting with them 
where Jeremy was trying to figure out when to quit his job or when to put in his notice. And Steve told him when to put in his notice. And I said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Like, we need to wait till the first of the year. And he was like, no, we're moving forward. Jeremy, put in your notice to your job. So I was like, good luck on Jeremy getting paid. I mean, you pay him then, whatever you need to do. But uh, it was like pressure from every side. There was pressure from uh, them. There was pressure from Shauna. There was pressure from my mom. There was pressure from, I think Mr. Folletta saw what a painful process I was in. And he was, you know, he would tell me like are you sure like you are you sure and then boo that worked in the office there she couldn't stand steve like she was like there's something ain't right about him or something he's trying to control and um i just kept kept pushing through like you know i gotta do what i gotta do and um you know we got our final inspection the health department came in and i chose the wrong kind of paint for the kitchen so we had to repaint the whole kitchen oh. at the last it was just crazy and then when he came back again a week later, the paint wouldn't dry. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And then there was a problem with the uh, in the bathroom there, the employee bathroom. The hot water didn't work. So found out the line wasn't hooked up for hot water. It was just something every day. And that building was had been built in the 60s, and it was so old, and it still had the original AC and everything. And, I, you know, we had to rewire, put up all new lights, all new plumbing, uh, uh, had to put in a, um, a ventilation system in the kitchen. And, you know, that cost me 15 grand. And it was just like, what am I getting myself into? It's crazy what started out so just kind of simple, hopeful and exciting. I mean, yeah, the irony is simplicity catering. <laughs> um, yeah, it turned into a just how quickly it turned into just just stress and just like a what do you call it like a something that's just about to implode or explode at any moment yeah like it's a pressure cooker that's it was crazy um but there was some there were fun parts to it like i got to re remodel the dining room and you know i put up like old birmingham pictures and you know when i was doing the menu i took a cue from tony and i named something on after people that were my investors or my family, you know, like granny's rolls and stuff like there was a lot of neat stuff that happened in that. I originally, you know, for people that are Kairos fans, I originally wanted to do garlic bread, Mm kind of like focaccia bread, like what Tony did. Yeah. And my grandmother had this roll recipe that I didn't, she kept telling me about it. And I kept saying, that don't sound, I don't, that don't sound good. The month or two before we opened, uh, was over at my Aunt Glennis's and she had some bread on the table. I said, where did you buy this? And she was like, I made it. And I said, you don't, you don't know how to make bread. And she was like, no, that's mom's recipe. And I was like, oh, these are good. It was the granny's rolls that yeah. we had at Cairo's. And I was doing a Leonardo's catering event at Hunter Street Baptist Church in Hoover. Mm-hmm. And the lady, it was like my fourth or fifth one I'd done for them. The lady that ran their food service, they had a huge food service. She found out I was opening a restaurant. She was like, you come back on Monday and you bring a truck or a van and I'll give you everything I got that I need to get rid of. Oh, wow. So she gave me, Granny's Rolls originally were little bitty, like mini, Uh, like a mini cupcake size. Yeah. But she gave me 15 muffin pans (laughs) from Hunter Street and they were rusted and me and Jeremy took them and cleaned them up. And that's how the rolls got to be that size because that's all I had to work with. Like I was, we were running on fumes, but we got up to the end. We had a, uh, somebody was doing some kind of conference there the week before we opened and they asked me if they could, if we could like cook for it. And it was like a hundred people there. And I mean, it was, wasn't free. They paid for it. Right. But so it was, I I called it like our uh, dress rehearsal for Kairos. So I had me and Jeremy, and then I had Lenora, and then Wanda was the lady that went to church with us. She wanted to come work with us. I sent her to Leonardo's for like six months to be the busboy during lunch to learn how to do... Wanda to be the busboy? Yeah, well, that was what she wanted to do. You mean bus girl? Bus girl. Bus person. (laughs) Sorry. Politically correct. (laughs) So she had went to work at Leonardo's to learn how to do that part of it. Lenora got a job in Mountain Brook at Alexa's learning how to wait tables because there was nobody had any experience. And then I hired Jeremy at Leonardo's as a food runner on Monday nights just to get a feel for the restaurant business. Uh So I was walking this. I'm the only one with any real experience. They all three had like a combined like six months experience right. in the food service business. So it was a, it was a weird time, but um, 
the day that we did the uh, that little thing getting ready to open the next yeah. week, it was going great. You know, people were loving the food. It was like, man, this is going to be so much fun. And my mom came and she was trying to help. And she went back in the kitchen and she said, uh, what can I do to help? You know how my mom is. She's all, ha, ha, ha. What can I do to help? And she said that Jeremy, like, had a glove on, was back there doing something. He snapped his glove at her and looked at her and said, you don't work here. Oh. And she lost her mind. Like, she <laughs> she gave him a what for. And um. you know how mama is when <laughs> Phoenix City come to Birmingham to the Kairos Cafe uh. at Grayson Truth Church. It was, a, it was, but I wasn't in there. I was somewhere else. And I came and I was like, where's my mom? And, uh. Oh, she she left, and I was like, just like that. She just left. She do not sound like her. So I called her, and she was crying, and she was like, "He talked to me." Like, blah, blah, blah. so it was this big deal, and I was like, "What did he say?" And so I went in there, and I was like, "What happened with my mom?" And uh, he said, "Well, she came back here trying to help, and I told her you don't work here," and she got all bent out of shape. And by this time, because of the stuff with Shauna, they had started making her like the bad guy too. Oh, so um, yeah, I mean, I think that is important to note that there was a lot yeah. of extra. There's things. a lot of friction going on there, right? But then, um, I'm like, you know what? I don't play about my mama. Like, <laughs> I, you do not know. Um, you, I don't care how you need to figure out whatever you need. To, I would never talk to your mom like that. <laughs> and this ain't gonna work. Like, you're not gonna be able to work with me. Like, you're you're not gonna. Nobody's gonna talk to my mama like that. You know, my mama. Well, I mean. <laughs> It was an unnecessary, yeah, di- almost did. like a dig at her. Right, you know, like right. You, you decided not to be a part of this. So, oh, but you know, okay, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, it was like a cut, yeah. and uh, but he started crying and he cried the rest of the day. And I'm like, well, you gotta stop crying. I said, call her and just tell her you're sorry, do something. And so he like called her and told her he was sorry, and she I could hear her on the phone. <laughs> she was like, "I don't know who you think you are. You think you JJ, but you ain't. You ain't him, okay?" Um, so it was just, and it was so hard because then like Shauna got involved in it, and she was like, "He didn't even really say nothing." And I was like, "You know, he's a smart ass when he wants to be." Oh, I can and even. So I can it was actually... just like it was like total conflict. But then Tanya got in, and then Stephen Lenore, and everybody. When you're talking about it now, I can almost feel the tense. It was bad. It was a bad situation, um, and it would only really only get worse from there. But uh, we got our, you know, we're ready to go. We got approved to operate. Everything was ready to go. Steve was trying to get me to open the next day. And I'm like, no, I'm going to have some margin, you know. And we planned the day. It was a Monday in, in December. It was like the second week of December, which I thought was stupid. Like, why don't you open it right before Christmas? Like, why not wait till after Christmas and start fresh on the new year? But by this time, he had a lot more leverage and was like pushing me and pushing me really which part of me i can understand the pressure i mean i've we've talked about the pressure you felt but that he felt yeah now knowing having all these loans in his name that it, it does affect you differently yeah and it wasn't just that like he had a lot of the people that invested i mean i have people that invested because they believed in me but a lot of them invested because steve told them to mm. so he had his you know, he had his influence on the line. There was all these loans. It was just a mess. Right, it was a right. mess. And then the thing with Shauna had blew up, and we were trying to we were trying to repair that. You know, she was. You know, her divorce was final by the time everything. It was still not a good situation. Mm-hmm. It was a bad situation. So, worked all week getting it ready. You know, my mom went to Pottery Barn, uh, not Pottery Barn, Pier One, and bought me a bunch of dishes and brought them in. And I was like. I, by this time, I just didn't want to hurt her feelings. It was like, you don't bring expensive dishes like that up in a restaurant because they're going to break. But, I, you know, I didn't want to tell her that. And then um got down to the wire. I'm, let me tell you, Sunday evening, it was me and Brandon. <laughs> Brandon came with me. It was me mm-hmm. and Brandon. We went and got all my supplies to open on Monday morning. And um that was uh, opening day, December 2006. It was... uh People talk about being excited about starting stuff like this the whole day. I just wanted to throw up. I was Why? So, I was scared. Yeah. I was scared to death. And I knew it was just so much work and so much conflict. And then it was like. So much money that had been. That. But then the, something has shifted with the, the people that were working for me. 
So it was like I was in charge, but Steve now Steve was in charge. So it was like you had two bosses, and uh, it was one like of him. these people were his wife, one was his son-in-law, the other one was his church member person. So it was just and you were the prison project. It was a disaster. <laughs> now I shouldn't say that, but okay. So but it wasn't a happy day for me. Well, it wasn't a happy day. No, it was an awful day. So did a lot of people come? Yeah, actually, the news came. They oh. came and did a news story. Well, Joe Brumbach from Shepherd's Fold, he called me the day we opened, early that morning, and he said, I have a, a contact, a friend at Fox 6 that wants to come and do a news story on Kairos. And I said, really? And he's like, yeah, they want they want to do it today on opening day. So I said, well, awesome. And he said, well, they want to tell your story. And I was like, okay, I'm fine with that. Up until that time, my my story had not been like public. They right. made my story public that day, but they did a um like a uh, it was on every one of their broadcasts that night, and I think the next day too. It was pretty cool. That's really neat. Okay, but I do but the wanna... people that came the first day, I wanted to do a soft opening. I didn't want to do like you know try to get a, we got to figure this out. Right. It was mostly all people I knew. Yeah. But it was a neat day. Well, you just said it, it wasn't a good day for you. For me, it was awful. So I just wanted to throw up the whole time. Just like I, I, it was like I had a premonition that I've gotten myself into something that's going to be a disaster, and it was something that I don't want to be in. I don't want to be controlled by other people. So to me, that's really sad. I mean, what would you say, like, for other people? Like, what, what's, what was the biggest takeaway? Like, what's the lesson you feel like you learned and you would want someone else to know? That you don't do it. You don't do it at all costs. Like, you don't move into something. You don't, you don't push through something at all costs and give up your freedoms, give up. You know, I made a lot of concessions during that time. Yeah. Things that I would never do again. Mm-hmm. Like, I would never ever even come close to getting involved in a situation like that again yeah but uh you know once you get in you're in yeah so but i don't want to make it all bad it was it was exciting the restaurant part you know uh sounds like it (laughs) no i mean i mean i it it would get more exciting but I, i was scared yeah you know i was scared and that's a lot of so and it felt like everything was falling on me right but then Steve got a lot of, like, say, I guess. So maybe you mentioned this, but just so I understand. So from the very, the initial talk with Steve mm-hmm. to when you opened, mm-hmm. how long was that period of time? Like 18 months. 18 months. So everything. It was a long, drawn-out process. Yeah. And yeah. then, time, you know, I would say, what am I doing? You know. Mm-hmm. But. We wow. got there. We yeah. opened up. I believed if I built it, they would come. But as you'll find out in the next episode, uh, Ollie's had been gone from there for about 15 years, and they didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> Some people came. They uh, did come. No, no. I mean, my my friends came. Yeah. Like church people. That wasn't even that big of a church. Yeah. <laughs> it, it wasn't big enough a church to, uh, to support a business. But, right. But we got there. We'll talk about the next one. I learned a lot, um, stuff that I still use this day. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to push through and keep going. But a lot of good came out of this. Um, so we're here. We got Kairos. I got the restaurant. I got the girl. You know, I started this off saying, you know, every dream of mine that I thought I ever had was coming true. You got the restaurant, you got the girl, but you were tired and terrified. No, in the end, what I thought <laughs> was my dream became more of like a nightmare. Ooh. Or no, maybe not a nightmare, but a very bad dream. More about that next time. <laughs> thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you next time. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Straight Out of Prison podcast. For more exclusive content, head over to our website, teamjones.co slash podcast. Yes, you can subscribe by clicking on the Become a Patron button, and that's going to get you access to our For Real Reel, which is very different than the Highlight Reel. reel. Some very juicy content there. Good stuff. Or you can look us up on Facebook and Instagram, Straight Out of Prison Podcast. Yes, that takes the story to a whole new level where you can see some of the people that James talks about in his story and see some of the places that he's been. I've been loving it, and you will too. Prison recipes. Yeah, all the things. (laughs) Good stuff. (laughs) We'll see you soon, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.
getting anything out of these videos, please hit the like button, the subscribe. If you never want to miss a recipe or anything I do, hit the little bell and you'll get notifications. Thank you.